abundantly. And I don't care how you dice that, slice it, how you, how you want to portray it. But none of that sounds to me like just get by and survive. So I, I want you to arrive at a position in your heart and mind where you begin to believe. And I mean, I mean really, really believe that there is a destiny for your life. My job here is to get you to begin to believe with all of your heart that there is a purpose for you being in the world. And that purpose is, is more than just smoking and drinking and drugging your way to a grave. That, that purpose is more than just having casual sexual relationships with one person after another all the way through your life. It, it's more than, you know, just doing that and hoping that somewhere eventually you're going to wind up with somebody who will at least tolerate you for the rest of your life. That's not destiny. That's not purpose. Destiny is about more than cars and clothes and homes. Come on. It's about more than bank accounts. It, it's about more than all that stuff. It's about more than coming to church at the posted times and doing your duty and your obligation once or twice a week. Destiny is greater than, listen to me, it's greater than attending recovery meetings for the rest of your life. Destiny is about purpose. Destiny is about victory. Destiny is about discovering that God has a divine plan. He has a divine plan for the rest of your life. Destiny is uh, that, that, that you, you understand, you begin to understand that in your life there are going to be divine intersections. You with me tonight? Divine intersections in your life, to, which are times that in your life where your gifts, your skills, your passion, your experience, your personality begin to merge together into the revealing of and the carrying out of the reason why you are here to begin with. God never intended for anybody in this room to wander aimlessly through life and just make it. He has foreordained, predestined, preordered that you would arrive at an intersection where every... Remember, let's go all the way back to week one. Before you were formed in your mother's womb, He saw you. He called you what you were supposed to be before your, before your mom and daddy ever made you. He saw you as who you would ultimately be. Doesn't matter that we've put our hand in it and messed it up along the way. It hasn't, it hasn't changed His view of us. Hasn't changed His purpose for us. And He has pre-ordered our lives to where we would arrive at some point in our life. Listen, there are a lot of you that have taken a lot of detours because of choices that you've made in your life. You've taken a lot of back roads. You've took the winding way around. But it hasn't made God change His mind because the gift and callings of God are without repentance. And when God says a thing, that's exactly what He means. And so He meant for your life to arrive at an intersection where everything He saw in you to begin with meets up with what he designed you to do you with me but you don't do watch this you don't discover destiny by searching for it you don't discover destiny by searching for it you discover destiny by searching for God Woo! Tweet that. You, you, you don't discover destiny by searching for it. I'm going to find my destiny. I'm going to find my destiny. I'm going to find my destiny. See, when you try to find your destiny by searching for it, what you do is you use human means and human efforts and you use human mindsets to try to discover what it is that you're supposed to do. When if you will just begin to search for God, when you find God, you will find purpose. So when you, when you find God and, and you, you allow God to begin to reshape and reform and transform the image you have always carried around about who you are, what's going to end up happening is you're going to find your true self and you're going to begin to live up to and out of God's idea for your life rather than settling for some subpar existence. See, in a lot of us, let's just, can we just be frank and open and honest here tonight, a lot of us have settled for subpar existence. We, we've, we've allowed certain conditions and situations in our life to bring us to the place to where we feel like we, we just kind of have this ho-hum attitude. Well, this is what life has dealt to me. Listen, it's not what life has dealt to you. 
It's not, now listen, there are some things that come, in to, come at us and come toward us in life that we have no control over. But the one thing that I do have control over is my response. I, 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 have, I have control over how I respond to what life brings to me. And listen, when I'm searching for God, it gives me a new perspective. It gives me a new mindset. It gives me a new attitude that I don't just have to accept everything that comes down the road into my life. But everything that comes down the road into my life, I can understand that if I filter it through the lens that God has a purpose for me, then no matter what it is that comes down the road of my life, even this God can use to bring me to where He intended for, for me to be. So, so watch this. The story, of, the story of Gideon takes place in a period of Israel's history where there was no king. They didn't have a king when Gideon was alive. And because there was no king, which how many of you understand kings represent authority? Because there was no king, there was no accountability. Because where there is no authority, there's no accountability. And the scripture says that because there was no king, there was no accountability. And so it goes on and it says that the people, due to lack of authority... And due to the fact that there was no king, every man did what was right in his own eyes. Watch. It does not say that they did not know what was right. It simply says that they did basically what they wanted to do because there wasn't any authority to hold them accountable to anything else. No authority to keep them count, accountable. And so what happens is, they, or what happened to them was, they begin to live their lives out of their own lust and their own passions and doing whatever felt good in the moment. That's how they begin to live their life. They begin to, they, they, they threw off restraint. If you remember, uh, maybe a few weeks ago we talked about in Proverbs where it says, where there is no vision people perish. Or, and, and another translation says, where there is no prophetic voice, people throw off restraint. They, they, they don't live, they don't live uh, with any kind of restraint because there's nobody there holding them accountable and there's no word coming that, that makes them accountable for their actions. And so this is what was going on in Gideon's day. There wasn't a king in the land. And so everybody was living to their own ideas. Everybody was living to what they thought was right or how they viewed what was right in the moment. And remember this, we told you last week that there's no such thing. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make a lot of people mad in here, but there's no such thing as karma or coincidence. Those are made up humanistic secular ideas. I don't care how many times you post it on Facebook. It doesn't exist. It, it, doesn't, it doesn't make it true because you put a meme up there. About what karma's name is. Hello. Not, not any such thing. And, and what you need to understand is while there's no thing in the world such as karma, there is a biblical principle and a biblical precedent of seed time and harvest and reaping what you sow. It's not karma. If you plant green beans, you're not going to get black eyed peas. You will reap what you sow. If you sow stupid, you're going to reap stupid. Come on, somebody. If you, if, if you, if you sow lack of control, you're going to reap chaos in your life. If you sow with bad decisions, you're going to get bad results. That's not karma. That's just the law of seed time and harvest. That what you put into the soil of the ground of your life is what's going to come up. So, so as a result of these people living out of their own desires and passions, the people that we're talking about are Israel in the book of Judges. And the reason that, they, that we chose this tonight is because there's a group of people that started living out of their own desires and passions. There was no king, so they did everything that was right in their own minds, started living the way they wanted to. And now then, in chapter 6 of the book of Judges, we find an entire nation of people, the whole, the whole tribe of Israel, the whole group of people of Israel, are now living under the oppression of a group called the Midianites. And I want you to understand this. 
Not only is there a biblical principle that you reap what you sow seed time and harvest, but there's also a biblical principle that teaches us that we become ruled over by whatever it is that we give control of our lives to. So I don't believe you, Larry. Good. So Romans chapter 6. For all those who don't believe me, says Roman Paul said to the to the people at Rome, "Do not let sin control the way you live. Do not give in to sinful desires. Watch this. Do not let any part of your body become an instrument of evil to serve sin." Woohoo! Woohoo! Don't give any part of your body. We used to sing a song in Sunday school when I was growing up. Be careful, little eyes. What you see, be careful little ears what you hear, be careful little hands what you touch, be careful little feet where you go. Why? Because when you lend yourselves, when you lend your instruments, when you allow evil talk to come out of your mouth, come on somebody, (laughs) nobody's wanting to hear me tonight. He said, don't let any part of your body become an instrument of evil. I'll let you talk about the rest of the parts of your body. Don't let any part of your body become an instrument of evil to serve sin. Instead, give yourselves completely to God. For you were dead, but now you have new life. So use your whole body as an instrument to do what is right for the glory of God. Sin is no longer your master. For you no longer live under the requirements of the law. Instead, you live under the freedom of God's grace. Well then, since God's grace has set us free from the law, does that mean we can go on sinning? Of course not. Don't you realize, here it is, here's the principle, that you become the slave of whatever you choose to obey. So you have a choice. You can be a slave to sin, which is going to lead you to death, or you can choose to obey God, which leads to righteous living. Somebody say amen. Amen. You have a choice in this. You have a choice in this. Look at your neighbor and tell him you have a choice. Come on, look at your other neighbor and tell him you have a choice. You have a choice in this. You have a choice in the direction that your life is going to go. So so by the time we get to the story of Gideon, Israel has been being tormented and ruled over and oppressed by the Midianites for seven years. Because even though they knew what was right, they chose to do what was wrong because they recognized no authority in their lives. And so because they chose not to do what was right, that decision... Caused them to come to a place of oppression by an enemy. We live in a culture right now. I I knew some of you just didn't want me to get here. But we live in a culture right now where people want to do what is right in their own eyes. Mm Mm-hmm. And some of you want me to start naming stuff, but if I, if I start naming stuff, then I'm going to have to name your stuff. Come on. If I, if I name stuff, I'm going to have to start naming your stuff. So I'm not, I'm not going to name stuff. I'm just going to tell you that, that we live in a culture where people want to do what is right in their own eyes. And I think that everyone in this room knows that I love people. People. I love people. I love people. I love people all colors, shapes, sizes, opinions, beliefs, lifestyle choices, whatever other labels that that we want to assign to people or they wish to assign to themselves. I even love difficult people. And there's a few in this room tonight. I, I love you even when you're mad at me and don't love me. I still love you. Even when you're difficult to love. Even when I try to hug you and you go like... I love you. Absolutely 100% love people. 
But that doesn't remove the truth that many people are living under the oppression of their own choices, their own passions, and their own lusts. Because just because you can do something doesn't mean that what you're doing is right before God. Might be right in your eyes. You may have convinced yourself that how you're living and what you're doing is okay. The structure of our society may support you in your belief system. But every man, every woman is going to arrive at an intersection of what they believe is right and what God says is truth. And it's in that intersection of what I believe is right and what he says is truth. It's in that intersection that my future is going to be determined. Because God never ever forces us to choose his way. He just wants us to understand that his direction is for our protection. And people of purpose, people of purpose, learn how to live restricted lives. Come on, somebody. People of purpose. People who know they have a reason for being here. People who know they have a destiny. People who know that life is about more than just me fulfilling my own desires. Learn how to live restricted lives. People learn how to do that because... I don't give in to every passion of my mind or every lust of my life or every desire of my mind or body because when Israel began to do what they wanted, the result of them doing what they wanted was seven years of oppression from people who wanted to rule over them. And the number seven is the number of completeness. And that means that Israel was under complete control of misguided passions and misguided desires. And when I arrive at the intersection of truth and my own desires, and I choose my own desires, I fall completely under the oppressive rule of my own choices. This is important for you to hear. When I arrive at the intersection of what I want to do and what God's Word and His truth say, and I choose what I want to do over what truth is, At that moment, at that intersection, I choose to go my way. Watch this. And the moment that I choose to do what I want to do, because I don't want any authority in my life telling me what I can or can't do. And so I choose my own direction. Then what happens when I choose my own direction? I immediately begin to walk into the oppression Of my own desires. This is important. When I choose my own way. I do not fall into the judgment of God. I fall under the oppression of my own will. And there's a huge difference. Because what we have done in church for years. Is say that when I choose my own way. God starts sending judgment into my life. And every bad thing that happens to me is God judging me for choices and decisions I made. God doesn't have to judge you for choices and decisions you made. Because when you choose your own way, you will reap the oppression. Not His judgment. Come on, somebody. I hope I'm making sense. So, so I don't fall. So, so here's, here's what we need to stop. Right here tonight. Right now. Right now. Right now. 20 minutes into this, what we need to do is stop blaming God for all the chaos in our life. Gideon said, hey, if you're for us, why is all this stuff happening to us? He wanted to blame God for why everything was falling apart in his life. It wasn't God's fault. God said there's a way to do things and there's there's a right way to do things. But because you guys have chosen your own way, look where your way has gotten you had nothing to do with me. But isn't it funny how when we go our own way, we call to Him for help? Come on. And so, i got to stop blaming God 
for all this chaos in my life. And I've got, I've got to begin to see and realize that choosing my own way was like unlocking the door of my house and giving complete and total access to every oppressive spirit that tags along with the choices and the decisions that are opposed to the truth that God desires to live in and through my life. That's why, we, that's why we talk all the time about, man, listen, you got to be careful about who you get into relationship with. If you're not careful, uh, if you're not careful about who you get into relationship with, what you will do is you'll open your door, you'll open the door of your life to every spirit that ta that's tagging on to the person that you're getting into relationship with. Do you, can I just talk plain? I know we have a few children in here. Just do their ears like this for just a minute. <laughs> but do you understand that, that God, God, God's idea, listen, the reason God had the idea of monogamy, one for one, was because when you, when you get involved in a sexual relationship someone, with someone, it's the most intimate relationship that you can be involved in. It's not just physical. That's why when the Bible talks about the sin of adultery, it, it, it carries greater weight as far as the person is concerned because it doesn't just involve the physical body because when you get involved sexually with someone, you, you get involved with the soul. And because you get involved with the soul, there's a transfer. In a physical act, there's a spiritual transfer. And so when you get involved sexually with people that you have no idea where they've been, who they've been with, and what they've been doing, you're unlocking the door to your life and you're, you're basically saying, everybody you've been with before me, I'm inviting you into my life. And then we wonder why there's such wounding. Woo, ain't nobody talking to me tonight. We wonder why we can't get over stuff. We wonder why people are willing to, to kill people who want to leave them. There's soul ties. There's things that get down deep. I don't know where that came from. It's not in my notes. Somebody needed it, so hallelujah. <laughs> so you have, to be, you have to be careful about what you get connected to. Listen, it's not, just, it's, it's not just sexual relationships either. It's friendships. Everybody's not out for your benefit. There's some people you need to learn to look at and say, hey, thanks, thanks, for, thanks for liking all my stuff on Facebook, but that's about as far as you're getting into my life. Well, and let me go a step further. Some of you need to be, quit putting all your stuff on Facebook. <clears throat> because when you put all your stuff on Facebook, you invite everybody into your life, and when you invite them into your life, you invite all the, 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 the crap that they're carrying. Hallelujah. I paused and anointed it before I said it. <sighs> because, listen, you, you need, because, man, sometimes the people that want to get closest to you want to be close to you because they want to mine information out of your life. <laughs> Everybody that attaches themselves to you and calls you their friend is not your friend. I don't know why I'm saying this tonight. Everybody that attaches themselves and calls you is not your friend. You need to be careful about relationships because it'll open doors in your life. You listen. I know y'all think I'm crazy. I know. I already know that. But you need to seek God about relationships. You need to seek God about friendships. You need to ask God. Hey, is it good for me to be connected to this person? Got to be careful about what church you get involved in. Hello? Hello? I, I said on Sunday, I, I said this on Sunday, man. Listen, every person, every person that leaves my church leaves a bruise on my heart. It does. I'm sorry about that. I'm, that's the truth. That's just real because I love people. So when you leave it, it or when people leave it, it, put, it leaves a bruise on my heart. I'm not trying to hide that. It, it bruises my heart. But the fact of the matter is, okay, I'm going to be, <laughs> I, I, 
See, when I start getting real transparent, some of y'all need to say, get back on track, Larry. Because I'm about to mess myself up here. But the truth of the matter is, while there's people I love, and while it bruises my heart when everybody can't stay here, there's also some people that when they chose to leave, I was like, whew. Is that too real? Why? Because everybody that walks into a church doesn't carry the heart of the church. Everybody doesn't have the same vision. Everybody doesn't want to go where we're trying to go. And listen, it's hard enough to pastor a church like this without people fighting against me. And if you're an easily offended person, this church is going to make you upset. Why? Because people are weird here. They are, Jesse. They're weird, man. People are strange here. People got a lot of messed up stuff here. People come to this church messy. And you know what that means? We have to use messy people because they're the only people that are coming. And so people walk into this church and they can't, I can't believe you're using them. I can't believe you. If he, if he must not know about what's going on in their life. If I stopped using everybody in this church because they had a mess, I'd be the only one still here. Hallelujah. Come on. Just kidding. I'd be the first one out the door. You understand what I'm saying? Man, come on. I, and so what, what I have to understand is, man, I, and I said this, I think I said this Sunday, sometimes you have to do the math. Every loss is not a loss. I know you get upset when people leave your life, but every loss is not a loss. If they weren't adding anything to your life, then when they leave, you haven't lost anything. Woo! So let me, let me hurry. We, we, have to, we have to stop looking. We have to stop looking at the instruction of God. Watch. We have to stop looking at the instruction of God as God's way of keeping me from being happy. God's instruction is always in the best interest of your advancement in your life. When He says do this or don't do this, His direction, we got to get this, His direction is for my protection. Come on, write that down. His direction is for my protection. His direction is for my protection. His direction is not because He doesn't want me to have a happy life. But he just knows if left to my own choices, I'm going to do harm to myself. So, I have, we ought to be able, and maybe this fits you, maybe it doesn't, but, but we ought to be able, I think almost everybody can identify with this illustration. We ought to be able to look at the role of parents and understand that when someone doesn't follow our direction as a parent, it makes it hard for us to provide protection. Hmm. Hmm. I, I've talked about this a lot, so I mean, you can take it for what it's worth, but uh, there was a time in my son's life when he got really angry at me and he screamed at me one day and he, he this is what he screamed at me and I won't scream it because I'll scare you but he he screamed really loud at me why don't you just let me make my own mistakes and before y'all all start judging my son y'all said the same thing so because if all of us in this room would have learned from other people's mistakes, many of us wouldn't be in this room. We'd be at, on the board at the first church of the frozen. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So, so what... So when my son tells me, let me make my own mistakes, 
my heart grieved. And the reason my heart grieved was because, Ron, my heart grieved because I wanted him to listen to me because when I tried to tell him, don't go out there and get in the car with those people, I wasn't trying to hamper his fun. I just knew that that was not going to end well. Hello? I remember sitting in court the day that the gavel fell. And the judge pounded the gavel and said, two years. And my son in an orange jumpsuit turned around in handcuffs and his eyes were that big. And he wanted me to do something. But because of choices he had made, not following my direction, he forfeited my protection. And it came to a moment where I could do nothing. And see, God is not trying to keep you from a happy life. But if you keep going your way, you forfeit His protection. Because you will not follow His. Hmm. And I hope I'm okay tonight. See, many times the reason that children are disobedient to parents is because they don't see what parents see. And because they don't have the view of the situation that their parents do, They only see the authority of their parents as restrictive rather than protective. But years later, when they live long enough to sit in the seat of a parent watching over their children, then they suddenly understand that every directive is not meant to be restrictive. And I'm not trying to dampen your joy for life. I'm trying to protect you from from what you cannot see from where you are seated. So the only way... For me to really begin to understand the directives and the directions of God for a fulfilled life is for me to begin to see myself as He sees me. So everybody say it together. I am... Some of you getting it. I am royalty. I am royal. And if you never see yourself as royalty, you'll keep on making peasant decisions. Mm. Somebody somebody told me the other day, why are you you teaching all those crazy people at your church that they're royalty? Because they are royalty. Where is it ever written that you had to be sane to be royal? (laughs) Ray, you just have to understand that you're royal. I don't care what anybody thinks about me. I, I know who I am because my mind is changing about how I see myself because he's showing me how he sees me. Isaiah said it like this. Isaiah 55, they'll put it up there. But Isaiah 55, verses 6 through 8, says, Seek the Lord while you can find Him. Call on Him while He is near. Now, everybody's going to leave me right here because you're going to get mad. Let the wicked change their ways. So let me just give you the the meaning of the word wicked. The Hebrew word there is rasha. And all it means, listen, don't get caught up in the word wicked. All it means is one guilty of sin. Come on, does that take the edge off of it a little bit? He just called me wicked. Anybody ever been guilty of sin in here? Come on, raise your hand if you've been guilty of sin. You qualify. So, if you've been guilty of sin, change your ways. And banish the thought of doing wrong. Let them turn to the Lord that He may have mercy on them. Yes, turn to our God for He will forgive generously. Go on. My thoughts, God says, are nothing like your thoughts and my ways are far beyond anything you can imagine. So Isaiah was saying to me and to you, the reason sometimes we don't understand how God sees us is because we're not sitting where God sits. But if I can raise your level of thinking, you can begin to see yourself how He sees you. 
So what I'm trying to drive home is I, I don't understand many times how or what God does or is doing. And the reason I don't is because I don't see what He's seeing. But if I can get another view, I may be able to understand that He's directing my life and protecting my life because He sees so many times what I do not see. So here's something you need to gain from the story of Gideon. The Midianites don't just pop up out of nowhere. The Midianites had always been present and they had always been the enemy of Israel. They were always present but were not always active. Your enemy may not always be active but he's always present. Whew. Come on somebody. Just because they are not active against you at the moment doesn't mean you have won them over. I am preaching so good tonight. <laughs> Hallelujah. <clears throat> and it's your willingness to follow God's direction that provides you the security of His protection. So when I go God's way with my life, He sees what I don't see. So that the landmine that the enemy set for me that would totally blow my life up as long as I follow God's plan and God's path. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for thou art with me. Come on somebody. Woo! He shows me the path of life. He leads me in a plain path, the psalmist said, because of my enemy. His word, his direction is a lamp under my feet and a light under my path. His hand leads me. His word guides me. Goodness and mercy follow me. He prepares a table before me in the presence of my enemies. So even when my enemies surround me, I sit down and receive strength and sustenance and rest because he he guards, guides, and redeems my life from destruction. And what the enemy thought he could do, he cannot do because I've chosen God's path rather than my own. I got to go, but watch this. So, this attack of the Midianites in Gideon's day you need to get this. The, the, the Midianites did not wipe out and they did not annihilate the Israelites. But they sure did agitate them. <laughs> Anybody know anything about an enemy like that? Stuff may not be killing you, but it sure is getting on your nerves. Come on, he ain't taking me out, but he's wearing out my last nerve. I've come a long way in my marriage in 32 years, but there were several years in my marriage where every time I looked at Rosanna, she said, you are on my last nerve. <laughs> I just wanted to see how long the last nerve was. Hallelujah. <laughs> About 12 years ago, Twelve years ago at IHOP, I found out. She pushed my wedding ring across the table and said, I'm done if you don't act straighten up. <laughs> I said, I'm a catch. I can't tell you what all she said after that. Hallelujah. <laughs> Stuff that a preacher's wife shouldn't utter. <laughs> True story. <laughs> she'd, she'd tell me that stuff. Man, you're getting on my last nerves. And all of us know what it is to have something in our life that's just rubbing us and rubbing us rubbing us and rubbing us and rubbing us. It's not killing us. 
but it sure is agitating me. And the Midianites didn't kill the Israelites. But watch this. This is, this is powerful to me. They didn't kill them. But what they did was they impoverished them. The Midianites came in and instead of just killing the Israelites, what they did was they came in and destroyed their fields and they stole their livestock. Because in that day, that's the way people lived. Whatever you grew, you ate. And what you didn't eat, you sold. To sustain yourself. So the Midianites came in. <laughs> you got to get this. They came, and if, if your fields and your crops are constantly being destroyed, you're going to go hungry and your bills aren't going to get paid. So the Midianites impoverished them. And I want somebody to get where I'm going. I'm, I'm trying to finish, but I want somebody to get where I'm going tonight. There, there are some attacks from your enemy that are not designed to kill you but it is designed to rob you. Some things He sends into your life, He's not sending to kill you. He's sending it to rob you. And just because, watch this, just because you are surviving does not mean that you're not being affected. So your enemy's stealing from you. He's stealing joy. He's stealing hope. He's stealing peace. And watch this, you may survive this season, but if the enemy has stolen joy, peace, and hope from you, you might survive the season, but when the season is over, you're going to come out on the other side bitter. And you weren't bitter when it started, but now that it's over, you're bitter. And that means that somewhere on the way through it, some things were stolen from you. He didn't kill you, he just stole your value. You're right. That divorce didn't kill you, but it wrecked your self-esteem. Them leaving you is not going to end your life, but it sure messes with how you look at your self-worth. Come on, somebody. He stole your value. He stole your self-esteem. He stole your worthiness. The enemy did. He stole your focus. Come on, man. I need another illustration, Joey. You, you held focus pretty well. He, he stole all of that from you. But I believe, watch this, I believe that the promise to David in the book of Samuel is still a promise to us because the book of Samuel records this in David's life. 1 Samuel chapter 30 verse 7 through 9. David comes back from a battle. His wife, his family, the men that went to battle with him, their wives, their family, everything has been hauled off and been kidnapped and destroyed. And he, he said to Abiathar the priest, bring me the ephod or the word of God. So Abiathar brought it. And David asked the Lord, should I chase after this band of raiders and will I catch them? And the Lord told him, yes, go after them. You will surely recover everything that was taken from you. So David and his 600 men set out and they came to the brook of Bazar. And it goes on that they recovered everything that was stolen from them. And I believe not only was that promise for David, it's for me and you. But watch this, the first thing David had to do was not consult his friends. In fact, the Bible said that when he came back, the 600 men that with him were so distraught that their families and their, their houses and all had been destroyed that they thought of stoning David. Do you understand? Listen, I just want to be real here tonight. Do you understand that in pastoring, there's a lot of times that as a pastor of a church, I can't, I don't find necessarily comfort in the people I pastor because a lot of times they want to stone me. they don't like what I say all the time and don't like the dirt. So a lot of times I have to encourage myself in the Lord, which is what David had to do. 
And the Bible said when he encouraged himself in the Lord, that's when he began to ask the high priest, bring me the word of God. Because David understood that at this crisis moment in my life, I don't need to be on Facebook and I don't need to be on Twitter and I don't need to be on Instagram and I don't need to be snapping nobody and asking them what they think. I don't need any of that stuff. What I need to do is get my face in the word of God and find out, God, what do you want me to do at this moment in my life? Because I'm at an intersection if I go my way I'm going to wreck and ruin my life but I want to go your way and recover everything that I lost in a bitter season hey so y'all doing okay so God shows up in Gideon's life and Israel's been in seven years of oppression. And the Israelites have been functioning. Watch. Because the enemy didn't come to kill them. He came to steal from them. He robbed them. He impoverished them. So they've been living seven years out of a deficit. They were living, but they were losing. Some of you in here tonight are living, but you're losing. You are. You're living, but you're losing. There's no joy. There's no peace. There's no hope. Sitting right here tonight, you don't have any hope that tomorrow is going to be different than today was. You're living, but you're losing. So after seven years, the Israelites finally cried out to God for help. Watch this. So God sends them a prophet. Now they're being oppressed by an enemy, treated bad by an enemy. They need deliverance. But God, when they cried out for help, God sent them a prophet. He didn't send them a warrior. He didn't send them a fighter. He sent a prophet come to them. And when the prophet comes, he doesn't come with a solution. You have to go back and read this for yourself. Judges chapter 6. He doesn't come with a solution. He comes with an explanation. And the reason that he came with an explanation and not a solution was because if God were to help them out without showing them how they got in, they would end up in the same place. That's why some of you keep ending up in the same messes over and over and over again. Because you want a solution when what you need is an explanation. You need a prophetic voice that will tell you the reason you're in this mess. Because you followed your path and not mine. Come on, somebody. See, God wants to do a work in your life that once it's completed, watch it. Man, this is so powerful to me. God wants to do a work in your life that once it is completed, you should not need it again. Because if I know what caused it, I should be able to avoid it. I really am trying to quit, but whatever. So an angel goes to Gideon. There's a prophet that came to speak to Israel and give them an explanation. But while the angel's giving an explanation to the leaders of Israel, or while the prophet is giving an explanation to the leaders of Israel, an angel visits this guy named Gideon. Because God had a strategy for deliverance. But he needed a leader to carry out the plan. So Gideon is hiding out. Because remember I told you they they didn't come to kill them. They came to, they would destroy their crops, their fields. So they would take away their harvest. And so Gideon 
had harvested some wheat and he didn't want the Midianites to steal, steal it. And so he went into a wine press where they normally crushed grapes to make wine and it was hidden because you didn't thresh wheat in a wine press. You threshed wheat out in the open because you wanted the wind to blow away the unusable part. But Gideon is so desperate to keep some of his crop that he goes in to a place that wasn't designed for threshing wheat <laughs> and he's in the wrong place doing the wrong thing. And that's where the angel comes to him. So the angel comes and tells, watch this, the angel comes and tells a hiding, scared man doing the wrong thing in the wrong place that the Lord is with him. That just went right over your heads. He came to a scared Hiding man doing the wrong thing in the wrong place and walked up to him and said, Hey, the Lord's with you. <laughs> man, I want you to get the truth of that word. When Jesus said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. That's exactly what he meant. David said, I could make my bed in hell and even there your presence is going to be with me. So listen to me somebody. Doing the wrong thing in the wrong place. God was still with Gideon. And some of you may be in the wrong place doing the wrong thing. But I came to declare on a Wednesday night, the Lord is still with you. Nothing that Gideon's doing looks like a mighty man of valor and a warrior. But any time God gets ready to reintroduce you to yourself and give you another view of you, God will never waste time reminding you of your own smallness. So the angel didn't tell Gideon, I know you're a little scared man. That's not what he said. He didn't even identify, acknowledge Gideon's fears and smallness. He just walked right in and said, hey, mighty man of valor. And Gideon's like looking around. Like, and Gideon starts making excuses. You talking to me? I'm from the family who's the least tribe in Israel. And not only that, I'm the least in my family. Who are you calling a mighty man of valor? You're in the wrong place. No, Gideon, you're in the wrong place. You see yourself different than what, oh, come on, than what I see you. And I'm not here to deal with your smallness. I'm here to deal with the greatness that's on the inside of you. See, God calls you according to what He sees in you. And that's why you need to stop hanging out with people who can't see in you what God sees in you. Because if they can't see it, they'll never be able to call you by it. Hmm. We're kind of going through this thing in, in, Christ, in Christendom. Um, I, got, I got some friends. And I, I want to be sensitive here. But I got some friends that are doing some of the same things we're doing as far as in the realm of trying to reach out and transform people's lives. And I had a guy tell me the other day, he said, uh, we, we don't like to use the word recovery because, you know, we've gotten too sophisticated. So we, we try to find other words and all this other kind of stuff. Whatever. But I got to looking up the word recovery. God told David he would recover all. I got to looking up the word recovery. It comes, it's etymology. The etymology of our modern English word recovery is from a French word. I wish I could say it in French, but I'm not French. Recouvre. <laughs> Something like that. Yeah, it's that. And the original meaning of, of the word, and, and I like this, it means to regain consciousness. Yeah. Bam. Uh, See, the wind of the Spirit is blowing at the refuge to try to wake some of you up to regain consciousness of who God has called you to be. You've been living in an altered state so long of what you think you are. That's why you need resurrection. So, 
See, when God gets ready, you've got to separate yourself because if people don't see it the way God sees it, they'll always call you by what you've done, where you've come from, and how far you still have to go. But when God gets ready to give you another view, He calls the end from the beginning. And He calls the things that be not as though they already are. I used to have people tell me, and they were serious. It wasn't a joke. You keep preaching, Larry. One day you're going you're gonna to become a preacher. You're not much right now, but you keep working on it. <laughs> I think I've told, I told this story before, but I, I had a lady... I had a lady come up to me because I used to lead worship. I had a lady come up to me. I was, I was 15, 16 years old when I, 14 when I started leading worship. And when this happened, I was 15 or 16 years old. Man, I was still young. I, was, I couldn't hardly look people in the eye. It was, it was tough to get up in front of a bunch of people. And back then, we didn't have a cool church like we have. When I get up and lead worship, they'd look at you like that, all mad and stuff. Yeah. <laughs> And I had a lady walk up to me after a service and, and she said, you know what? <laughs> if you would work on not singing through your nose, <laughs> it would make it so much more pleasant for all of us who have to listen to you. <laughs> And from that moment, Willie Nelson became my hero, man. <laughs> and I thought if, if, that, if that old high hippie can make it, hallelujah. <laughs> Come on, somebody. And, and what I had to do, I had to learn to stop letting what others... Mm -hmm. See, you may... You may Come on, Leland, I'm, I'm really done. Thank you, man. You may see yourself as insecure and unstable and insufficient for the task and unreliable with actions and indefensible in some of the things that you do. But God says, I don't see you that way. He told Gideon, I see a mighty man of valor. I see a king. I see a queen. I see royalty. I see a warrior of righteousness. But Larry, I'm not righteous. No, but he was. <laughs> and my life is hid in his. So if he is, I am. Larry, you're a drug addict. No, you're, you're calling me by what you used to know me as. I used to be in the wrong places doing the wrong things, but even there, God... Was with me. Because if he wouldn't have been with me. I wouldn't have got out. Gideon. Told the angel. He said I'm not able to do what you're asking me to do. Because the only thing that Gideon had to go on. Was his current behavior. He looked at himself. Scared and afraid. Doing the wrong thing in the wrong place. The least of the least. And all he had to go on was his current behavior. God called, the, the angel called him a mighty man of valor, valor and a warrior. And he thought, what do you mean warrior? I'm hiding from him right now. All I've got to go on is my current behavior. But listen, your current behavior doesn't change God's calling. But I guarantee you, if you listen to his calling, his calling will change your behavior. Guarantee that. Because if you listen to his calling and start following his path, there'll be certain behaviors that you can't carry in the places that his calling is taking you into. Mm. 
So stop lying to yourself based on what you're doing right now. Don't allow your current behavior and condition to talk you out of God's calling and purpose for your life. You may feel inadequate, but your inadequacies haven't affected God's purpose for your life. And the greater understanding coming from Gideon's story is that an entire nation had been praying for a deliverer. They didn't know it was Gideon, and neither did Gideon. But the freedom and victory over an oppressive enemy for an entire nation was directly tied to Gideon's view of himself. And if a Gideon's opinion was going to be, if it didn't change, if, if how he saw himself didn't change, an entire nation was going to be left in the clutches of this cruel enemy who continued to rob and to steal from them and cause them to live impoverished lives. So what are you saying, Larry? I'm saying that your self-image is not just about you. There are people waiting on you to get another view of you. Ten years ago, mad, bitter, burnout. Listen to me. Ten years ago this month, mad, bitter, burnout, wanting nothing to do with ministry. Sick and tired of all that I thought had come into my life because of ministry. Wounded, bruised, and bitter because I'd been through a season where some things had been stolen from me. A lady by the name of Gay Green stopped me on a parking lot in Sherman, Texas. Asked me could she get in my car. She got in my car and I was wearing sunglasses. It was a bright November day. And I was wearing sunglasses and she, she got in my car and she said, could you park over there please? And I parked my car. And I said, what can I do for you? I, and to, to be clear, I knew, I know her, knew her, still know her. Wasn't a stranger. But I said, what can I do for you? We worked together and and she said, well, the first thing I need you to do is take off your sunglasses so I can look you right in the eye. And I thought to myself, another bossy woman. <laughs> married, got a daughter, and now somebody I'm not even married to is trying to tell me what to do. Take your glasses off. So I took my glasses off and I, she said, now look at me. And I looked at her. And I said, what can I do for you? She said, I have a word from the Lord for you. And I'm smart enough to know, you know, I didn't get all uppity. I knew it was God speaking. I could sense. I was mad, but I wasn't stupid. And I could feel and sense the awareness of God in that car. And she said, I have a word from the Lord for you. She said, last night I had a dream about you and the Lord told me to find you today and He just told me to give you this sentence and tell you this. You need to hurry up because people are waiting on you. I'd have known it was going to be y'all. I'd have kept driving. <laughs> but in a burned out place in my life, thinking that my life as a minister was finished and completed, I had sold all my library. I had given everything away. I was done. But on that afternoon in that car, I realized that what I saw wasn't necessarily what he saw. And let me tell you, over the last 10 years, he and I have had to have more conversations 
because my viewpoint has had to be adjusted many more times along the road. And every step I've taken into His purpose, He's had to remind me, you can do it. I don't think I can, God. Yeah, you can. Why do you say that? Because I'm with you. Because I'm with you. And what somebody needs to know is, the real problem with Gideon wasn't outside. It wasn't the Midianites. Listen to me. The answer to the Israelites' oppression was in Gideon. The problem wasn't the Midianites. God already had a plan to take care of the Midianites. The problem was getting Gideon to see himself like God saw him. So that he could do what God instructed him to do. So I'm here to say to some of you tonight. That the answer for the enemy that's coming against your life. The enemy is not really the problem. The problem is you. And how you see yourself. And until you change your view of you. You'll always give the enemy power over you. Because if you could see you like God sees you, you would understand the prophet Isaiah that no weapon formed against you will ever be able to, to prosper. Addiction can't take you out. Infidelity can't destroy your life. Abandonment by your mother or father, your spouse, can't wreck and ruin your life. Abuse has to release its power over you. Lack of education or finances has to bow down. Family history cannot derail you. Why? The size of the problem is not the problem. The problem is how you look at you. Open the eyes. Come on, stand with me. Open the eyes. Woo! Let me see me like you see me, Jesus. Open the eyes. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you, Jesus. I lifted up, shining in the light of your glory, pour out your power and love. Father, I pray for every person standing and hearing my voice right now. I pray for the light to come on, for illumination to begin to happen, for them to begin to see themselves the way that you see them. God, I do not believe in the life of this church we've ever spoken anything more powerful or more relevant than what we're talking about right now. Because if people can begin to see themselves like you see them, we will see lives radically changed. Because many in this room will stop accepting a lesser existence when God has called them to be royalty and mighty men and women of valor. I pray a release of revelation over this body of people. I pray that people would begin to reach up and grab a hold of truth. I pray that those that are in this room that are in the intersection of truth and their own way would find the strength to follow your path, to choose to seek your will and then watch as blessing unfolds in their lives. Father, I speak and declare blessing over every home and every life that's in this room tonight. We are rising to our rightful place and we refuse to go back to who we have been 
and where we have come from. I declare it now in the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Come on, look at your neighbor and tell them I'm royalty. Hug 12 people on your way out of here.